morning. How's everybody doing? It's good to be in the house of the Lord with you. It is uh, good for me to be in my new home church. We're glad to be here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the abundance of talent you have blessed this church with. Thank you for the gift of music. And thank you for the gift of instant access to you through your son, Jesus. And Father, we need you to show up. Nobody in this room needs to hear a word that I have to say. We need to hear from you. You've never not showed up. You have chased us while waiting for us at the destination. You chase us to it and wait for us to get there. So I know you're here. Open our eyes so that we can see you. I pray that you bless this time in the strong and matchless name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You can be seated. You don't know me. You may have read some things about me, but you don't know me. If it hadn't been for John, you wouldn't even know my name. Matthew, Mark, and Luke mentioned about me, but they didn't give you my name. John gave you my name, and if it hadn't been for him, you wouldn't even know me. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were cool letting you know I got my ear chopped off by Peter. But they didn't tell you my name. And there's not been a great deal of ear-related crime in history. I mean, Vincent Van Gogh did that to himself. That doesn't really count. Uh, and other than that, you kind of got Tyson and Holyfield, and that's about it. Not a lot of other ear-related crime. I became a servant to a man named Caiaphas. He was the high priest. And he was the high priest that saw to the crucifixion of Jesus. I was an Arab. I was not a Jew. I was an Arab, and so I wasn't a Jew, and I sure wasn't Roman. I was a true outsider. The only work you could get as an outsider was to be a servant. That was it. And so uh, I became a servant to a Pharisee. I became a servant to the high priest of the Pharisees. But that said, like Caiaphas always treated me well. He treated me well. He treated my family well. That went all right. And so there came a time where I got to make a decision. Do I want to stay here? Do I want to continue to work uh, for this man? And, and, and I decided, yes, that I did. And that means I became a bond servant. Right. Now, there's a ceremony that you go through for that. Uh, and in that ceremony, you get your ear pierced. And so how that goes is they lean you up against the doorpost. And your master drives an awe through your ear. And then they give you a special earring. And it has his symbol on it. So everybody knew I belonged to Caiaphas. And that gave me special status. And I like that. Special status is all right. Even if you were a slave. I mean, special status as a slave. It's better than no status slave. It's better than we'll work for food, slave. So it was all right. Gave me special status, and I liked it. And I became my master's eyes and ears in town. Okay? It was my job to let him know what was going on, who was starting trouble, who was stirring things up, what the people were talking about so he could stay in touch. That was my job, and it was a very politically charged environment. And I mean political. <laughs> but y'all are no strangers to that. Right. Amen. So the people in power 
saw people like me and other people and people not in power as transactions. Anybody familiar? You're not a person. You're just a transaction. You're just a vote. You're just something to transact, somebody to use to get your way. Every relationship was transactional. How can I use this person to get what I want? Does anybody know what that's like? I was a transactional relationship for Caiaphas. I got him what he wanted. I spied on everyone for him. And I trusted nobody. So when I showed up places, shoot, let me tell you, man, the, mas the mark of my master opened doors. Didn't matter that I was an Arab. I got in. I could go anywhere I wanted. This allowed me to move through the town and watch people and listen to people. I got to know what was going on, and I could listen and watch and report back to Caiaphas what was going on. And he was very concerned about this man named Jesus. He wanted me to spy on Jesus and all those that were following him. Just another transaction for me. Like, why not? It was just another guy. Just another troublemaker coming through town. Just somebody else promising that they were going to change the world. My master had given me an earful about this Jesus. He had told me a lot of things about him. And I'd heard the other leaders talking about him and none of it was good. So I had an expectation when I first came across this Jesus. I'd been told what he was like, and so I expected that. And I first heard this man teaching in the temple, and I got to tell you, he just didn't match the picture I had been given. He didn't sound like they said he sounded. He wasn't doing what they said he was doing. He didn't seem to be that much of a troublemaker. And I was there one day, and it happened, and Jesus said, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one, and I mean no one, comes to the Father but by me. And I said, oh, okay. There's the arrogance they told me about. Okay, I hear it. There it is. That's what I've expected. It was either arrogance or 99 shades of crazy. Pick your pick. It was one or the other. He was crazy or arrogant. That's all the two choices I could see. But then he said that his yoke was easy and that his burden was light. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Shoot, that's my life. Go ahead and make me great, Jesus. <laughs> I can assure you, my master wasn't saying anything remotely like that. Caiaphas didn't say, oh, Malchus, you're great. No, he said, go listen for me. Go watch for me. He never let me forget I was a servant and that I was a transaction. And for Jesus, this wasn't a transactional relationship. I wasn't to be used. And if that wasn't enough, then he said that he did not come to be served, but to serve. Man, Caiaphas don't say anything like that. This is different. My master was the exact opposite. You always knew, oh, he was there to be served. Not Jesus. So now I figured out, this is why he doesn't like Jesus right here. I mean, that makes sense. He's coming for your power. I get that. But this is why he didn't like him. And that day, my right ear just started to itch just a little bit. And now looking at his followers, you know, I had to find somebody to exploit, right, to get our way in. Judas was an easy mark. I knew that guy was easy. Setting up that meeting took no effort. 
That was easy. Everyone could see that guy was greedy and money was all it would take. And really, not that much money. Judas was just another transaction. And so Caiaphas wanted vengeance for all these things that Jesus was doing. And after I let him know that Jesus started healing people and telling them their sins were forgiven, oh no, that was it. That was it. It started to get ugly from that point. And so the meet with Judas went down just like it had been planned. And yep, he was as easily bought as I thought. And Passover, man, it was a rough time for me and my family because it was this stark reminder that we did not fit. We were outsiders. We were good enough to work. We could put food on the table. We just couldn't eat from that table. It was made very clear to us, you are here as transactions, you are here to serve. We were not part of the chosen people, and they made it very, very clear. And you know, they were way too cool with that. They were way too comfortable with just knowing that they didn't have to worry about anything. They didn't, that they didn't have to worry about us at all, that we were not part of the chosen people. They kind of dug it. So after Caiaphas and his family finished their Passover Seder, I was dispatched to go and meet Judas and some of the temple officials. The temple guard and my master had transacted with Pilate for a detachment of Roman soldiers. And when you know what a detachment of Roman soldiers is, you need to understand there were 600 Roman soldiers in us going to arrest one man. You might call that overkill. So 600 and a few of us went on to arrest one Jesus. And my master had told me how awful and dangerous this Jesus was. I hadn't seen it yet. It didn't match what I had seen. It didn't match my eyewitness account. He didn't seem this dangerous. And the whole night was just so strange. These battle-tested Roman soldiers seemed really nervous, really anxious. Some of them were trembling and shaking on the way in. Judas was clearly nervous. But it really couldn't have gone any better for him. I mean, we walked into the garden. His disciples had fallen asleep. They weren't watching out for him. We walked right past them. In fact, our noise woke them back up. So there was nothing to worry about. Judas did his job. He walked up, greeted Jesus, kissed him. But when he got up there, Jesus spoke first. Whom do you seek? When the reply came back, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. That's all he said. That's all he said. And all of us were knocked to the ground. 600 battle-tested Roman soldiers and temple servants and temple priests, we all hit the ground. From him just saying, I am he, that was it. Several hundred fell to the ground. And listen, my master tried to speak with authority all the time. It never sounded like that. Nobody ever fell to the ground when my master spoke. Nobody. Nobody ever fell. And we scrambled to our feet. And then that was the first time I started to wonder, man, I don't know if we got enough soldiers. We might have come a little light. And he asked again, whom do you seek? And I thought, man, he's just playing with us now. Whom do you seek? And I was relieved when we didn't all get knocked back down. And he offered no resistance. 
I thought, well, but this is going really well. I thought we're going. This is going to go way too easily, and I spoke way too soon. Because this is when it started to get bad. It was just then that one of his disciples named Peter came out of nowhere and attacked me. I'm like, why me? Like, but look at all these people with weapons. You come after me? But Peter came after me, and I fell to the ground. And so it was the second time of the night I've been on the ground. But this time, I noticed when I was on the ground, my right ear was gone. Peter had cut off my right ear. And you know what was worse than that? Is nobody cared. Nobody said a word. Nobody was concerned that my right ear was gone and I was going to bleed out right there in the garden. He had committed a crime in front of 600 Roman soldiers and nobody flinched. Nobody went at Peter. Nobody tried to arrest him. Nobody cared. You want to talk about being aware that you are an outsider. The Romans didn't care about me. The Jews didn't care about me. I was expendable. When a couple hundred Jews and 600 Romans see an attempt on your life and you are literally bleeding out on the ground and nobody makes a move and they let the criminal go, Man, you know you just ain't nothing but a transaction. But just then, it happened. This Jesus, who said he had come to serve and not be served, came to serve me. Me, who orchestrated this whole arrest. He came to serve me. I had spied on him. And he came to serve me. He came to help me when nobody else cared. He came not just to help me. He came to heal me when no one else cared. Nobody in that garden cared except Jesus. And I felt his hands touch the right side of my head and my ear was healed. Now listen, you need to catch this. Jesus did not pick my ear up off the ground and reattach it. Jesus touched the side of my right, the, the right side of my head, and I had a new ear. I had come there as an enemy, and Jesus touched me as a friend. His healing hands that were tied in cords, those hands saved my life by serving me. I felt so awful for playing any part in this. I felt so ashamed. For being any part of this, I could tell inside my heart my allegiance had shifted. I no longer wanted to serve Caiaphas. I wanted to follow this Jesus. And so I followed him the rest of the night. I followed through the trials. I felt awful. I felt like I needed to do something to repay him. I needed to be able to do something to speak out on his behalf, to tell of the miracle that he had performed on me in the, in the garden so selflessly. But I knew they wouldn't listen. They knew he had raised people from the dead. They knew he had healed people. One more testimony wasn't going to matter. Their minds were made up as to what they needed to do. They were looking for vengeance. They were not looking for justice. They are not the same. This transaction was done. The fix was in. And what scared me was that these men had placed themselves in God's position while placing God in their position. 
This is not a great transaction. This is not a great change. And most of us do it every day. Before you get too mad at the Pharisees and Caiaphas, you do it too. The problem with you being your own God is you can't get enough worshipers. I know. But these men were judging God. There could be no more clear picture of sin than this. They were focused on a transaction to safeguard their power. And in the morning, I watched as they paraded him down the Via Della Rosa, all the way up to Skull Hill. I watched the path. I followed along. And I watched as they nailed those hands that healed me to the cross. I watched it happen. I looked around and I saw others he had served. I saw lepers. I saw blind Bartimaeus. I saw Zacchaeus. I saw the woman you know as the woman at the well. I saw the woman caught in adultery. I saw so many others standing there. My eyes that had served Caiaphas and had his view were now open. For the first time. And I could see clearly and I heard this Jesus speak for the first time since being nailed to the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And I stood there at the foot of the cross looking up at this man. heard him say that and I made eye contact with him and it was just then that my right ear itched again and I reached up to scratch my ear and that was the first time that I noticed that I actually had a new ear and what that meant was this ear did not bear the mark of Caiaphas. This ear no longer bore the mark of a slave. I was no longer a slave. I was no longer a servant to Caiaphas. My earring was gone. That thing that marked me as a slave was gone. There was no hole. There was no scar. There was no earring. There could be no mistake. Taking that my ear was not a transaction, my ear witnessed transformation. And that's the difference between Jesus and everybody else, is I'm not a transaction, I'm transformation. That's what Jesus is about. He's not about using you. He's not about needing you. He is about healing you. He is about loving you. He is about transforming you. There could be no mistaking that this Jesus was truly my Lord. It wasn't Caiaphas anymore. I knew I was different. I knew this man had changed me and made me different. I had been set free, not just from Caiaphas, but set free from myself. I belonged to the family of God. Caiaphas never wanted me. Caiaphas used me. Caiaphas employed me. Jesus transformed me. Caiaphas and everybody else wanted vengeance and Jesus wanted forgiveness. I had heard Jesus teach about forgiveness. I had always taught followers, he, and he had always taught his followers that they first must forgive in order to be forgiven. And here he was doing that from the cross. He was the first one to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so he is modeling his teaching. So I don't know about you, but if you've ever been hurt, Anybody in here ever familiar with pain? Anybody ever been hurt? Anybody ever been lied about? Anybody ever been betrayed? Anybody ever been used? Anybody ever been abused or misused? To desire vengeance is human. It is human, but we are never more like Christ than when we forgive. That's when we become most like Jesus. Not in a way that says it's okay that people hurt you. It's not okay. 
that people have hurt you. That is never okay. It is not okay for people to use you, abuse you, lie about you. That is never okay. And Jesus knows about betrayal, abuse, and pain. He knows it well, and he chooses to release us from the punishment that we deserve and to not hold our wrongs against us. And on Good Friday, he took that punishment that we all deserve. He took that punishment for us. This is transformation, not transaction. Man had placed himself in God's place. Just like we still do today. I've seen y'all from my heavenly vantage point. You still do it. We all know you still do it. But God placed himself in your place to restore relationship with you. To give you the opportunity to have that relationship back. And through this transaction comes transformation. And through this transformation, everything in this world is transformed. It's just waiting on the final day. But everything is transformed. And so now I knew what was really happening. This Jesus, who is now my Jesus, had become sin. He became sin so that we could have his righteousness. That was the ultimate transaction, so that we could know the forgiveness of God. He forgave us first. He forgave you first. He forgave me when he healed me and transformed me in the garden and transformed me from an outsider and made me an insider in the kingdom of God. He did that for me and he could do that for you. I had a master, his name was Caiaphas, but now I had a king and his name was Jesus. And, and, and anyone who knows what it is to have King Jesus knows what it's about to be lied on. You know what it is to be cheated, talked about, mistreated, used, scorned. You know what that's like. Can you forgive those people? Can you serve King Jesus and forgive those people who have harmed you? He forgave you first, and he will enable and empower you to forgive. He has paid our debt. He has paid mine and he has paid yours so that you can discharge the debt of those that have hurt you because it only harms you to hold on to. It. You not forgiving somebody is the same thing as you drinking poison and hoping they die. It's not going to happen. It is not going to happen. You need to forgive them. And we are never more like the world than when we seek vengeance. And we are never more like Jesus than when we offer forgiveness. This world seeks vengeance, and Jesus prays forgiveness. I don't know about you, but I needed forgiveness. I don't think I'm alone in here. I see a few people that I can see that you need some forgiveness. I see you. You're not that clean. You're not that pretty. You're not as innocent as you think. I see you. I know you. You need forgiveness. No more than me, but you still need it. All right, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. There's no elevation here. Everybody needs this forgiveness. I helped put him on that cross. I helped set it all up. I, I created the meetings. I found the guy. I found everything. I paid Judas the money. I got everything set up. I put him there, but no more than you did. You put him there too. No different than me. And he changed me, and he can change you. Does anybody know what it is to be changed? Does anybody know what it is to sit changed? To know that place. I sit at my Savior's feet. I'm so glad you changed me. I'm so glad you changed me to do what must be done. I'm changed. Lord, I'll work and work until he comes. I'm so glad he changed me. Anybody know what it is to be changed? Change. I'm changed. And you can be changed. 